Okay, name is Eric Landry, uh, CTO, CAIO, or Zateo Health. And I love my coffee, Americano. Um, my espresso machine is one of my prized possession in my house. Welcome back, ML Ops community. We are here with another podcast. I am your host, as usual, Dimitri Ops. And we talked all about the healthcare space, bringing AI into the healthcare space. Hi. High, high value uses of a rag chatbot, not this HR bullshit that you get. High value use cases and the nuances of it, the ethics of it, the conversational design and how it can be so difficult. I really appreciated. He's been doing AI for so long in healthcare. And I love the fact that he still is hands-on building. You can tell when we talk to him, he's going in there, he's hacking around. It probably would have been easy for him to sit back and become a manager, become an executive by now, but no, he's having fun with it. So let's get into this conversation. And as always, if you liked it, make sure to tell one friend so we can keep this gravy train rolling. So I think we should start with what we were just talking about, and that is you coming into this field in 2005. And explain to me, paint the picture of what things were like trying to do ML and AI in 2005. Yeah, so I entered the field through my schoolwork at University of Texas, um, and back then, um, my studies were, uh, my thesis was about um, a document clustering of scientific articles about genetics. My experimentation was basically testing different algorithms. Um, a lot of it is, you know, processing the data. Um, to, you know, an LP is usually pretty um, compute intensive. So finding the compute and the resources and the memory uh, was always kind of a constraint. Um, I was at that time working at Sun Microsystems. So, you know, at home I had a, a little MacBook and I would start I would start the algorithm running overnight and then half the time wake up in the morning with a stack overflow or some other <laughs> crash in my computer. Um, so eventually I wound up taking a lot of my work, a lot of the schoolwork with me to work um, at some microsystems. We had a lab full of the latest, greatest servers. So, you know, what would take overnight at home would take a couple hours over lunchtime. <laughs> it still took a couple of hours, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, and then all the the algorithms, as I had mentioned before, um, I wrote in Java, um, so there was a lot of attention paid to, you know, understanding, you know, reading a research paper and then, you know, writing the proof in Java. And a lot of times I would find that, the, you know, the, the proofs were actually incorrect in the papers. Not a lot of times, but sometimes. Um, and so, you know, being able to, you know, fast forward, you know, being able to, like, iterate through different algorithms quite easily was kind of a mind blowing to me. Um, but yeah, just kind of the constraints around the compute, um, the memory, um, just, you know, data processing, um, data transformation and cleaning, et cetera, was all a lot more challenging back then. Yeah. People don't realize how good they have it with PyTorch these days. Yeah. I got real good at, uh, you know, in Java figuring out what the the optimal data structures were and how to, how to optimize, you know, data compression and, and things like this to achieve, you know, some, some of the algorithms you need everything, you know, all the data in memory. So that was a lot of times a challenge. So, yeah, it feels like you, uh, throughout your career have been attracted to very hairy problems because now you're in the healthcare space working in AI 
And there's a lot of constraints and there's a lot of difficulties in healthcare, whether it is with the data itself or it is with just how you can use AI, the different use cases. And so I feel like we're going to touch on a lot of these different pieces, but it would be nice to know about what you were doing at your last job, Babylon Health, because I know that you were the director of AI engineering and the conversation platform. That was like the prequel to what you're doing now at the current job. And what did that look like? Those are two different roles. The AI platform, um, my team was building a a cloud agnostic platform um, because at that time we were attempting to be cloud agnostic. So uh, we built the infrastructure around, um, you know, being able to deploy our models regardless of, of, you know, whether it's Azure or AWS or whatnot. Um, so all the challenges along, you know, how to optimize the, the, the different types of deployments. We had streaming, inferencing on a stream, uh, Kafka stream. We had inferencing as a service, um, and then, you know, batch type streaming. So we were supporting all those. Uh, we were also supporting, um, you know, cloud-based training. And these were NLP use cases still? Uh, it was any, you know, it was all that. Like it was NLP, it was, um, you know, structured data. Uh, we had a lot of, of um, medical data um, we were training models on. So that was that, was that piece. And then um, also the conversation uh, AI, you know, conversational platform. Um, we built chatbots. Uh, they were intent-based chatbots, you know, back in the day. Does anybody remember uh, intent-based chatbots? So we were using, uh, you know, open source frameworks to build the chatbots. Um, unfortunately, this we were six, we were building um, a conversation platform which included uh, live chat as well as um, you know automated responses with the chatbot, and you could hand off that. You know, the user could request uh, to be handed off to a live agent uh, if they weren't satisfied with the response from the chatbot. Um, so we built a whole system around um, all those features. And we, unfortunately, we released our chatbot probably three or four months before Babylon uh, closed shop in the U.S. Um, the... But it, our early indications that we were, our whole, whole focus was to deflect uh, users, uh, patient or our users from uh, the the live agents with an automated agent, and we were able to deflect up to forty percent of the users. So you know that's the real use case and the real value of of those chatbots. Yeah, and again, this is something that it's like history rhymes, right now. Everybody understands that because I think everybody's tried to throw a support chatbot with an LLM at their product. Yeah, it's interesting to kind of see the progress so far and kind of trying to, um, I guess, get through the hype and really understand what the real value is. Um, I'm I'm kind of slowly evolving. My thinking has started to evolve to where you you can't just release an LLM based chatbot without appropriate controls. And so the reality is almost something kind of in between, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm not quite there yet, but uh, I'm experimenting with um, some technologies that would enable kind of a, I guess, a hybrid type chat assistant and when you say hybrid you mean like rules-based or intent-based plus llm yes that makes sense yeah you can't let it be anything or else you wind up on the front page of the internet yeah because <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah you said something that chat bot said something it shouldn't have or it uh is just basically a wrapper for gpt4 yeah, I mean, and understand in healthcare, you know, okay, so somebody sold a truck for a dollar. <laughs> like, in healthcare, the stakes are a lot higher, right? So we kind of have to get it right. Yeah, and that goes back to the hairy problems that I was talking yeah. about. Like, there's 
real ethical issues. There's human lives potentially at risk when you're dealing with your use cases as opposed to, I do understand that selling a truck for a dollar is a bummer, but it's not like there's human lives at risk, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I have, that's a, the, the punchline I used to tell my teams at, when I was in uh, travel at Expedia was, um, you know, engineers want to tend to engineer and uh, a lot of times over-engineer things. And so my punchline a lot of times was, uh, well, you know, if this thing breaks, planes aren't going to fall out of the sky, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I had to yeah, rethink yeah. that in healthcare, you know. It's, <laughs> the stakes are a little bit higher, <laughs> you know, than yeah. running somebody's vacation. Uh, exactly. At Expedia, it's like, well, somebody's vacation, maybe you're not even ruining it. Maybe you're just giving them an opportunity to do something else more interesting. But yeah, with healthcare, it's a different story. And the, going back to some of these difficult issues with data, I mean, we all probably are familiar with PII and how big of a pain in the butt that is. So that's like first off. But I remember when I was talking to a friend that I mentioned before who was working at Babylon Data, Jeremy, and he was saying, when I talked to him back in 2020, he mentioned how one of the engineering issues that he was looking at in that moment was how to keep all of the data that is created in Canada in Canada. They don't, he didn't want anybody else to be able to touch that because that's illegal. But he still wanted all of the ML engineers to be able to train their models and have the most robust data sets that they possibly could have without like jeopardizing that Canada data set. And so those are some, yeah, like data access issues that are not easy to figure out. Yeah, th that's a real challenge. And, you, you, you know, the. The issue is that you cannot transfer data between regions, so you can't transfer data from the UK to the US to train a modeler or a you know inference you know on a model. Sure. So you have to come up with strategies around how to keep the data in place um, while you develop your solution. Um, you know, a lot of times we had different. You know, sometimes we had different models. You know, and and a lot of times it kind of makes sense because the data is different, you know, it's a different shape and different, um, different rules that can be applied to it. Um, we also had experimented with uh, federated learning where the data stays in place, um, but you train the model. Um, and so you're not transferring the data between regions, but you're, you have agents, I guess you would call it agents that live in the different regions. And then the, the, what's transferred is, are the weights uh, of the the model to you know come up with the optimal uh, trained model, and did that go forward? I, I think you mentioned that wasn't the most successful POC. Uh, it didn't go forward. Uh, I think there, you know, in these enterprises, different things take priority. <laughs> that that actually never surfaces as a priority. Uh, but it was it was a great experiment, and you know we were quite pleased with with the work we've done. Um, which is pretty cool because it also, it's not just between regions, but you can, you know, train a model on your phone, you know, so if you've got, you know, a hundred users, you know, you know, thousands of users, um, they can, their data never leaves their, their device, but we can train a model, right? Yeah. Based on all that data. Which is much more appealing for things like healthcare or if it's uh, like things that I'm saying with my therapist. I would yeah. prefer that yeah. data to yeah. be my data and not have to send it out to get models trained and whatnot. Yeah. Our POC was on um, uh, skin cancer images, you know, images that were taken. Um, we tested it on, on a mobile device training, you know, to detect if there's skin cancer or not. So you can see, you can imagine the uses for this kind of technology. Yeah, 100%. And... You did bring up something there on how it didn't really become a priority. In your experience leading AI and ML teams, what are the biggest priorities and how do you champion for them? How do you know which ones 
should be going to the top of the line and like being able to with confidence say yes here's the metrics that we're looking at we know that if we're doing this we can have success yeah you know a lot of these priorities come from the top down right so you've got you know product product people you know basically doing the the market research and understanding where the best use of the resources are um i always treated it as we were equal partners in it and that you know i've been in the industry for a long time i'm not a product manager but i've built a lot of products right so yeah um you know, together, you know, if you have the right relationship with a product manager together, you can decide what the priorities are. Um, and, you know, the challenge is how to balance that with you want your team to feel, you know, enabled to experiment and, um, you know, explore creative solutions. So how do you balance what the enterprise wants you to do versus what you think you can do and what you can build so it's a tricky balance and you know of course you've got to play some politics to get through it all and <laughs> at the end of the day hopefully it all works out your team you know I, I always felt like my team should have agency to decide what they build yeah. um you know within boundaries right um but it can work in a reverse too you know the engineering team should be able to propose new products and features right yeah so what are you working on now? Currently working in a startup called Zateo Health. Um, the Our focus is on bringing healthcare to underserved communities. Um, and what that, the, the, the kind of the why behind that is that they're, so, so we want to give the, these communities information about healthcare to keep them engaged in their healthcare. Mm. Um, the studies, there are studies out that show, um, people who are engaged in their health tend to live healthier lives. Right. Yeah. Um, and the reason why that's important in these communities is because these communities like black and Hispanic communities, at least in the U S they don't trust the healthcare system. I think something like 50% of blacks and Hispanics don't trust the healthcare system and this kind of lack of trust in the system leads to them not being engaged in their healthcare. Um, there's a study I quote often, uh, it's po posted on National Institute of Health that says there, I think it was the year it was 2018, there were 100,000 preventable deaths at the cost of $100 billion to the healthcare system because people were not uh, engaged in your health, not they basically weren't taking their medications. So to me, this feels like pretty low hanging fruit. Um, you know, everybody wants, looks for shiny objects, you know, how do we solve cancer or whatnot? Like, while that's super important, but this looks like to me, keeping people engaged in your health seems like a solvable problem. Right. So that's what our kind of focus is on. And the technology we're building is basically what I'm calling conversational AI framework. Mm -hmm. um, kind of the lead technology, of course, is a rag-based chatbot. <laughs> um, but it's built within a system. So, so I'm thinking about it holistically about what can these conversations tell us, not just about individuals, but what could they tell us about certain populations and segments within the populations. And so we can, from this, we can kind of begin to make inferences about how we can keep these people healthy, right? Not just kind of in place, like statically analytics, which we will do on these conversations, but but in real time, what, what are the trending topics? What are the trending terms? And what can we learn from that and how can we action action it? So just a simple example, um, in Austin, Texas, currently, you know, so we can build a window of, uh, we used to, I used to do this at um, Expedia, we had, we were using um, Elastic Surge to make real time uh, inferences about certain things, 
Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is put one window against another in time. So the last week compared to the, the last month, yeah. what are the trending topics or trending terms that stand out? So you can imagine in healthcare, um, you know, in Austin, Texas, this week, coughs and fevers are trending. Uh, and it happens to be flu season. Maybe we should send a notification to the people in Austin that they should go get their flu shot, right? Then, um, that's a very simple example, but you can imagine the kind of features and things that we can we can create out of this. So I understand correctly, engaging in your health is primarily just going to the doctor. It's taking medication that's prescribed to you. It's and it's that kind of stuff that some of us might think like, yeah, of course, that's what you do. But you're saying that that's not the common thing that some people do. You would think, but yeah, I mean, you know, some people have, you know, for example, diabetes, you know, there's a daily, re you know, you need, some people need a daily reminder to, you know, test their blood glucose levels. You know, some people need a reminder, you know, even me, like I, I generally stick to my annual um, checkups, but, you know, it slips like, oh, I usually do it in the summer, but guess what? Last year I did it in December, you know, who knows what could happen in those few months, you know? Yeah. But, but it's this just kind of engagement, not just in kind of like daily thinking about your health, but also kind of annual checkups. Um, if you have for, you know, prostate cancer, there's a, the notion of people who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, um, there's a notion that some of them can be, mon you know, the treat there's no treatment, they're just monitoring their health and they need to stick to the plan, right, to keep them healthy. Okay, and I have been known to talk a little bit of shit on rag chatbots. Yeah. Because I think they, for the most part, aren't fully thought through and the use cases are not that high value in your use case if it is keeping people engaged and getting them to take their pills or go to the doctor and it's saving lives like the stakes are very high there i think that is a great use yeah. of a chat bot so you just scratch an itch right there like yeah I, <laughs> i'm with you man like there's so much hype around this. There is value. That's undoubtable. But there's so much hype, and I feel like there's a whole lot of attention paid to, you know, different types of retrieval, uh, all, you know, different, you know, lane chain and all these technologies that I feel like we haven't really figured out how to get the most out of what we have. Um, let's step back and understand what it is we have and how we can apply it to a real use case. Um, I, I'm with you that like people think it's magic, man, it's not like, and, and we discussed earlier about guardrails. There have to be guardrails, especially in something as consequential as your, your health, right? You know, we're primarily, you know, seeking engagement with our population through, you know, notifications and information. You know, a lot of my experimentation has been around how to limit hallucinations, um, how to treat people and engage them in a conversation where they are curious about their health. You know, how do we lead them in a conversation about their health? Uh, we have we have healthcare providers and professionals on our, our, on our staff. Then I talk to them, and it's, it's really interesting to me how doctors think about when somebody walks in the door, how do they size them up, and how do they understand how best to help them and support them in their health. Oh, wow. Um, and so a lot of the experimentation I've been doing, aside from how to limit hallucinations, is how to engage them in a conversation, especially these 
underserved populations that don't trust the healthcare system. How do we get, you know, bring trust to them? So first of all, our, our knowledge base is a curated, trusted knowledge base. So any information we give them is from that knowledge base and limiting the knowledge. So basically I'm not using the LLM for its knowledge. I don't want its knowledge. I may as well go and search Google, right? Uh, I want the knowledge for our solution to come from the knowledge base of our curated information. The high um, quality data, I high imagine. High quality data, right? Yeah. That our healthcare professionals have advised us on, right? And how do we give them that information in a way that's meaningful to them? It doesn't like, you know, their eyes don't gloss over when we give them a whole bunch of technical information. Um, our, our, the doctors on our staff that I've talked to, they basically say, give them information that they need a bit at a time, right? So you don't, you know, somebody asks like, how do I get tested for prostate cancer or how do I get tested for diabetes? You don't give them three paragraphs. Yeah. You give them the basic information. There are three types of tests you can do for prostate cancer. Allow them to then ask more detailed questions about, you know, the PCA tests and then lead them through it, you know, kind of prompt them to the next question to ask. That's more meaningful to the the patient than just giving them three paragraphs, you know. Yeah, try and make it bite-sized and easily digestible. Yeah, and that's to me that's that's a lot of the challenge. You know, a lot of what I see, the information I see is like how do you respond to a question? Well, cool. Like we have a really good way to optimize question and answer. But how do you optimize the conversation, right? So think of it as a conversation, not a just a question and an answer, right? Yeah, and that's where the theories on how much to give someone come in. And you don't want to just give them this blast of information, which is hard with LLMs because they're constantly being super verbose. So, yeah, so that's, that's the challenge. That's uh, actually also something I've done a lot of experimentation on is tone of voice, like how you speak to them. I was going to ask, because of the different colloquialisms in the underserved communities or underrepresented communities, are you trying to put on different slang or accents or is that kind is that like a, a step too far is it seen as cheesy have you experimented with it at all yeah not not in that sense what i've experimented with is how to detect basically who that person is right not necessarily what we should have a we intend to have a profile of the user like so we'll know their race we'll know their age but how, you know, you can make inferences about not just level of education, but how how they want to be conversed with, right? And we don't, right now, our tone of voice is basically a standard um, tone of voice represented by our branding, right? The, the Zateo branding. But we intend to do experimentation about, you know, how we converse with people like do you you know do you want to talk with yourself like <laughs> you know do you want to talk to somebody that has the same tone of voice as you is that how you best respond and how you are best engaged in a conversation or somebody opposite you know i you know that's kind of yeah. experimentation that that we want to do right yeah i wouldn't trust it if it was talking like me it would be yeah, like wait probably, a <laughs> Most people will probably be freaked out by talking to themselves, you know. Yeah, yeah completely. Uh, but that's fascinating to think about. Like, it does it give you more credibility depending on the tone? And if so, do you want to be more formal because that's going to give you more credibility, or do you want to be more uh, informal and speak like people do from the different accents or communities that uh, they're coming from? Yeah, exactly. And how, how do they best respond? You know, maybe, you know, somebody 
with uh, you know without an accent, uh, let's say a Hispanic accent, responds better to somebody with an American accent or something else. You know, who knows, right? That's that's kind of the experimentation that we we need to do, right? And how are you evaluating this? Yeah, so I've built a framework for evaluation um, uh, based on Ragas. Uh, I'm using. I've done an integration with MLflow to track the experimentation. So baseline, we you know certain things that we're looking for. You know, obviously a lot of the you know faithfulness for detecting um, uh, hallucinations and bias. Uh, what I've found is that you know a lot of these kind of basic bias detection mechanisms don't test, don't don't inform all bias. You know, like yeah. <laughs> Um, the, I found a data set on Hugging Face that was basically labeled set for bias against different cultures, right? So I tested some of those utterances against uh, an LLM and, and then the bias detection, and it, it didn't it Ooh. didn't catch some fairly heinous things that, that were spoken, you know. <laughs> so so I wound up writing some, um, you know, my own bias detections for those cultures, right? And that's just hard coded in there as guardrails. Yeah, it's not. It will be, but we. What I do, my process is that I'm testing against a, a ground truth set of data I have, um, and before I deploy, I do a test to make sure it's good against that set. I will also be monitoring uh, in production, so we can send alerts if somebody starts screaming crazy shit like you know it's so funny you say that because i was at a conference last week our ai quality conference and somebody showed me a screenshot of a support bot interaction that their company was having and the person literally was writing in all capital letters give me a fucking human you dumb fuck <laughs> computer <laughs> And then it, 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 the LLM answered like something that was not getting them the human, and that just infuriated the customer. Right? It's like the last thing you want to do is not get them the human, and they're just going ape shit on it. And so, yeah, that's what you want to try and avoid. And I like the fact that you set up monitoring, so in case that does happen and something slips through the cracks you know right away and you can uh, presumably you you can step in and say hey sorry about that uh let's take a few steps back yeah yeah i think there also i'll add that um i don't know if i've mentioned it yet but the you know there i kind of view it as at least two types of bias there's this kind of like subjective type of bias which is I know what we're talking about. I mean, some of it's obviously not that subjective, but, you know, cultural sensitivity kind of things, right? Um, but there's also bias, like objective, clearly objective bias. For example, um, you know, the medical community, it, like, advises gen the general population to get start getting tested for prostate cancer at the age of 50. I keep saying prostate cancer because... Our, our MVP is going to be basically focused on prostate cancer and we'll yeah. build out from there for different types of uh, disease. We don't want to inform a black male to start getting tested at 50 because the guidance is, is 40, the age of 40 to 45 because they have a much higher incidence. The black and Hispanic communities have a much higher incidence of prostate cancer. So... You know, there's this kind of objective measurements that we have to take also, you know, qual you know, data quality type measurements. It seems like you decided to play the game on hard mode. Not only is healthcare, the healthcare space, very complicated and very hard, but now you're working in a space that is tailoring to these underserved communities. And there's a lot of difficult areas in that too that you have to navigate through yeah yeah I, I think yeah so <laughs> a little bit about that uh, for me um you know when babylon shut down last summer um i was 
kind of in a burnout, <laughs> you know, the, the, the problem. And the, by the way, this is probably about the third one I've been through like this, right? That's if you're in technology, guess what? Prepare yourself. <laughs> um, so the, the CEO, Kevin had contacted me and I was kind of at the point of like, and had, I had been s numerous contacts to, you know, looking to fill a, a role. Um, basically this one checked several boxes for me, you know, the, the healthcare, I've kind of decided that's where I want to play. Listen. Um, you know, the, the unfairness in our healthcare system, at least, certainly in the U S speaks to me. It kind of like scratched several itches and that's why I kind of decided to go with this. And aside from, yeah, okay. It's a pretty interesting technical challenge as well. And that, that was kind of the trigger when I started thinking about it was like, man, you know, there's data sets out there that would be kind of cool to evaluate and apply against this bias problem. And, you know, that's when, that's the one that kind of put me over. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is a real cool problem to solve too. Well, what's fascinating also is that it's not like you have the technical challenge of going out there and solving cancer. It's like the technical challenge, you know that if you can just get people to take their pills <laughs> or uh, scan their heart rate monitor or whatever it may be, these kind of low lifts for people, then it can lead to a much longer life and a, a much better outcome. And so the technical challenge is more on the implementation of what is already in the world, right? It's not like this cutting edge bioscience or you have to go discover a new drug, any of that. So that's also another piece that I, I find fascinating. And yeah, now you get to navigate more nuances of what kind of tone of voice are we using to get people to do things. And I imagine, are you bringing in psychologists too to try and help with this stuff or or good copywriters, marketers that can sell ice to an Eskimo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should say, I should mention we do have a, a. I don't really know what her title is, but she's a writer, and she's advising on tone of voice. Um, and basically, I gave her a whole set of question and answers from our chatbot, and she made a lot of corrections on it. So, so now I've got to go back and see if I can fix it. Right, <laughs> you know. That's the challenge is trying to figure out, and, and by the way, I, I say this before, but um, I think prompt engineering is an oxymoron because to me, there's there's a, not a whole lot of engineering principles that at least I can find to apply to it, you know. That's a great point. It's throwing spaghetti at a wall, really. I, I mean, maybe I'm doing it wrong. I don't know, yeah. but like... <laughs> Um, oh, that's yeah. True. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's see, you know, the interesting thing is it does seem like, you know, technically it's, it should be an easy solve, and then, but changing people's behavior is really, really hard. Yeah. You know, there you go. <laughs> and, 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 uh, kind of, it brings to my mind, one of the other things we're looking into is, um, you know, all these wearable devices using those to monitor people remotely mm -hmm. and then sending them a notification and entering them into the chat bot to kind of inform them about the, you know, the metrics that we see from their monitoring device. Um, this is actually something that, that I had done at, um, with my team had done at uh, Babylon. Uh, we were looking at mon remote monitoring for, um, blood pressure and we had a stream of data that if we detected, uh, uh, some metric out of bound for, for blood pressure, we would send a notification on the app and then that would put them into a, a, a chat with our chat bot and inform them about, you know, what it means and, um, give them information. And if they would like to speak to a live agent to schedule an appointment. Um, so we're, we're actually looking at something similar here. It, it's a tail health as well. Um, using the remote monitoring device to, um, and, you know, create a new conversation, uh, so that they'll, you know, again, engagement in the healthcare, right? Yeah. I, uh, I wear a whoop and 
I find it a little bit annoying when I get the notifications from Whoop that will tell me how my sleep went. And I also have a like 13 month old daughter. And so my sleep isn't the best. Actually, my daughter wakes up probably like three, four times a night still. She's got really bad sleep and my wife takes the brunt of it. She's the champion here, but I still am waking up every once in a while. And so whoop will send me these notifications like your sleep, your sleep could have been better last yeah. night. And it's like these passive aggressive things. Like you might want to take a nap today. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, man, I already feel like shit. You're not helping the scenario here. Like what's your deal? Whoop. Yeah. <laughs> You're giving me so many, like trying to just break me down. And so I feel like I am mentally stronger because of all of the abuse that I've had to, to take from this whoop notifications over the last year. Yeah. Hey, yeah. A good, a good friend of mine, his mother has diabetes and he was monitoring. And so he kept getting woken up at, in the middle of the night because her glucose level was dropping below some threshold. And so, so he had to kind of figure out how to, set her diet up but he was losing sleep because his mom wasn't paying attention to her health right <laughs> yeah oh man so the these are the things now i just wanted to touch on this uh evaluation again because i think one thing that i've i've thought about and i don't know if this is possible i imagine you've looked at it when it comes to guardrails and it comes to i know you mentioned you're using ragas right now there's also other options out there like uh, one called guardrails AI. And uh, I know there's Nemo guardrails mm-hmm. from Vidya. There's a ton, right? Have you not thought about, Hey, let's just throw everything at it just in case. And so it can catch every single edge case. Maybe Raga's is more, it's stronger in this area. And then guardrails, we can set up our specific guardrails we want, or maybe and I think they have like templates for different verticals and then Nemo guardrails has this strength or is that just too redundant and overkill? Well, I I think, so I'll I'll just kind of describe my thinking and my thought process. Um, So I'm using Ragas in a development phase, right? So, so for example, uh, I create a baseline um, and when I, of, of how this thing is behaving using Ragas. And so I'm logging those in MLflow, so I have a history of those metrics, right? And so I have a baseline and and I'll you know, just be specific. I started out using um, um, OpenAI um, ChatGPT 3.5. Um, I kind of did some kind of testing anecdotally with different uh, models, but this one just seemed easy and it was the best for me at that time. So then I started doing this study on hallucinations. Um, so what I did now have a baseline, right? And so I wanted to, I started with the LLM. Okay. So I ran the same tests against literally every LLM I could find. (laughs) Well, I should say that's not kite. That's a bit of hyperbole. <laughs> Every LLM in uh, Amazon Bedrock, right? Yeah. <laughs> so now I have a baseline on a you know a dozen different models, and the metrics that I care about with regards to um, hallucinations are the ones I'm paying attention to, specifically f- faithfulness, right? Yeah. And so that helped me decide which LLM to use. And it turns out, uh, so that was, I think, Anthropic Sonnet is the one that, based on my test, and, I, and I'll say this, don't trust me, trust yes. it with your own data. Everybody yes, yes. out there, this is not an easy pass. You still have to do the hard work. Um, you know, use it on your data because it may behave differently depending on your data, right? Um, so that created a baseline based on that model. Then the next thing I did was testing against different um, embeddings models um, uh, for the retrieval and different uh, of the parameters on the retrieval, you know, the K values, et cetera. Um, and so what I've been able to do is create a baseline and incrementally move it based on the metrics that I'm paying attention to, right? Mm-hmm. 
so that's how I'm using Ragus. Um, I'm also using it to monitor in, uh, I'm not going to say, I'll say production, but I, <laughs> we're not in production yet. We haven't delivered it in MVP yet. Uh, we, we tend to do a, a pilot in uh, October for Mount Sinai Medical Center. Nice. Uh, with Mount Sinai Medical Center. Um, so we'll start monitoring then, right? We're probably not going to have much throughput to really tell us a whole lot, but at least it will start to give us data. So I'm using Ragus to, you know, measure against a baseline and, and to monitor in place. What I'm, so, and then to, to, to take it to the next part of that discussion about the guardrails. So I'm experimenting with, experimenting with Nemo guardrails. Um, this that's is. the NVIDIA open source project. Um, I'm looking at that for several things, and, and I'll tell you one of the reasons why I like it. So the guardrail is basically I'm using it to test for prompt injection, uh, security violations to make sure the chatbot doesn't say something stupid. And so, you know, the guardrail will capture that and, you know, I can either change the response or, re, you know, make some statement about like, sorry, don't, I can't respond to that, whatever, like to be decided. Um, but what I also like about it is, is what something, what we had discussed earlier, um, I don't remember if it was on or offline, um, about the need for something between intent-based chatbots and LLM-based, generative-based chatbots. Mm -hmm. Because in some cases, I need to know what the response will be, right? Now, mind you, it's, it's the intent is going to be predictive, but at least I know what the response will be because I'm writing it out myself or, or whoever or product people or clinical people are writing it out, you know, yeah. how to respond to a specific intent. Um, so that's how I intend to use guardrails, not just kind of protect as guardrails, but also for for an intent-based type of response. Yeah, it does feel like anytime anyone wants to know information about other people and not themselves, that is a that's ripe for guardrails. But then it gets tricky again because it's like, well, what are other people? my age having problems with those kind of questions can come up but if it's like what is eric having problems with then the chatbot should be like oh well eric's fine and you can ask him <laughs> yourself <laughs> i'm not telling you anything about eric but if it's like oh yeah people uh 40 to 45 generally are looking after these things or these are the number one causes of health troubles in your area or uh of people in your demographic, with your weight, your height, that type of thing, and your background, whatever it may be. So, yeah, it's a it's a fascinating problem to think about, and I'm sure once you put it into production, you're going to see all kinds of ways that people are trying to mess with it. Dude, dude I've already warned everybody, man. Like, <laughs> I've done all my testing. Uh, we've got uh, our ground truth that is like, you know, medically certified, Ew. I guarantee you, you know, having done this for a long, long time, we put it out there with real people. If you think it will go wrong, it certainly will. You know, oh, yeah. like, I've learned that the hard way. Now, now, mind you, like, we're not going to have the throughput like at, you know, at Expedia. We had, I don't know, some of the, some of the models we were uh, exposing to like up to 2000 requests per second. We're, we're not going to have any, if we have 2000 requests in a week, cool yeah. you know like so you can kind of babysit it especially in yeah. the beginning yeah and especially if you're working with one hospital or healthcare center then it's really easy to be making sure that like all right cool this hasn't done what we didn't want it to do yeah yeah we'll be monitoring and and, and in fact what when we start the pilot um what we intend to do is start with a subset you know start with 50 users, um, see how it behaves, see how they behave, see how they react to it. They may hate it. <laughs> you know, we may have to start all over again. Like, yeah. who knows, right? I mean, that's that's an argument for, you know, getting exposure as early as possible. 
Um, totally. You know, they may love it. I'm, I'm expecting they'll love it, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> Hoping. Fingers yeah, but, crossed. Yeah, but we'll incrementally, you know, we'll learn from that. You know, we'll have several cycles. Well, we'll learn. We'll, you know, incrementally increase the traffic exposed and we'll learn more each round of, you know, incrementally adding new users to it, right? Yeah. Well, I think it is awesome to hear and you're adding so much value with a rag chatbot that I usually will talk about how it adds no value to companies because you get the HR experiences where it's like, great, now you spent all that time, all that effort on that rag chatbot and your employees know if they have 12 or 15 days of holidays. That you could have probably solved with search, but this proactive experience of trying to get people to be more engaged with their healthcare resonates with me. I love the vision and I thank you for coming on here, Eric. Appreciate it.